Hello, and thanks for tuning in to Hand to Hand in the Trenches, a missionary story podcast. I'm Caleb Hickam. And I'm Kimberly Croker. And we are your hosts for this episode of Hand to Hand. Hand to Hand is a ministry outreach of Charity Baptist Tabernacle in Amarillo, Texas. And Hand to Hand is a missionary story podcast that tells the true stories of Christians around the world who have hazarded their lives for the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Hey, welcome back. This week we are continuing with the intriguing story of John Birch, World War II hero, patriot, and spy. And he did all that while he was serving the Lord as a Baptist missionary in China. When we stopped our story last week, we were in the early 1940s, and John had just left the United States to go to Japanese-occupied China in order to serve God as a missionary. Well, before we dig into the story too much this week, let's give just a little bit of history for our listeners. Some of the listeners may not know what was going on in China at that time. China had been at war with Japan for three years, and it was a very brutal uh, war between the Chinese and the Japanese at that time. But even more so... They had been fighting a very brutal civil war for even longer. The civil war was fought between the two factions. One was led by General Izimo Chiang Kai-shek. He was the nationalist leader. And he was also a Christian man who encouraged missionaries to witness to his soldiers and had written a booklet entitled, Why I Believe in Jesus Christ. But at the same time, he was fighting against the rebels, the communist rebels that were led by Mao Zedong, and that civil war had been going on for many years. Now, Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists were bidding an uneasy truce with the communists in order to fight their common enemy, which was Japan. Right. It was a very bloody time in Chinese history, and thousands of people died every week from bullets, bombs, and famine. But it was a good time for the Chinese people to hear the gospel. Now one thing, please keep in mind that everyone involved in this podcast is from the Texas Panhandle. Yeah, definitely, definitely. We are a very, very long way from China. So we will be doing our very best to pronounce all of the Chinese names correctly, but please have a little patience and consideration. (laughs) Anyway, let's go ahead and get started. Yeah, yeah, definitely, please. All right, so... uh, Some of you may remember from episode one that John was born in India, and he was raised most of his life in the United States in the state of Georgia. So John was only 22 years old when he returned to the hemisphere of his birth. John's fellow missionary, Oscar Wells, was only 24 years old when they boarded the Japanese freighter to sail for Japanese-occupied China. When they entered customs in Shanghai, a smiling American was waiting to meet them. They immediately recognized the missionary as Fred Donaldson from a photo they had seen in The Fundamentalist, Pastor Norris's newspaper. Guys, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so grateful you finally got my letters and that the Lord has sent you. Um, Go ahead and hang on to your wallets as we go through these busy streets. Stay close to me. They rode in a rickshaw through the busy streets to a building that looked like a small hotel. It was the missionary home. Brother Donaldson told them that they would stay there until a room could be prepared at the church. Then Brother Donaldson left so that they could rest for a little bit before supper, and later that evening he told them about some of the things that God was doing in China. You know, when... Lois and I had to leave Hang Chow to come here to Shanghai. We were told that there's no property to rent anywhere in the city. Well, one day we were walking down the street, and I noticed these guys building a three-story brick building. I went ahead and asked how much it cost to rent. They said we could have it for $45 a month. 
Let me tell you something. God specializes in the impossible. Amen. You know, the church is packed every Sunday. We have evangelical meetings every night of the week. We have like 80 or so home meetings a week. We send a team of evangelists out to the country on the weekends. The souls that have been saved have burned their idols, given up their ancestor worship. It's been great. Come on, guys. I want you to meet the rest of the gang. Both men were made welcome by the gang, which was made up of Fred's wife, Lois Donaldson, and their daughter, along with two elderly ladies, Margaret Fitzgerald and Mother Sweet. Mrs. Sweet, God put China on my heart when I heard about your work in Hang Chow. And you, young man, are God's answer to my prayers. For years I have been pleading for him to send a young preacher who would be willing to serve those lovely people, and here you are at last. Tell me, boys, how do the Americans feel about the war here and in Europe? How do people back home feel about China? I'm afraid most Americans don't really think of China at all, except those who pray for and support missionaries over here. Don't they understand the threat communism poses? We're told that it's just a civil war between the Chinese. But we have heard about missionaries who have been killed by the communists, like John and Betty Stam. There have been many others. You have not heard even a tenth of it, but you will. Later, John asked Mrs. Sweet, or Mother Sweet, as they all liked to call her, to tell him about Hing Chow, the city that God had burdened his heart about. As she began to think back about Hing Chow, the Hing Chow of her youth, a smile spread across her face. It's about a hundred miles south of here. My husband and I were there over 40 years ago. Many souls were one, and we started both a boys' school and the girls' school. Then our Northern Baptist Convention was corrupted by modernism. They had put aside the precious truths of God's Word. So we just resigned and came over to the Fundamental Baptist. Again, God blessed. But my husband became sick, and we had to return to Wisconsin. I buried him three weeks later. You came back alone? Everyone presumed that I would stay, but this is where God called us. Margaret has helped me, and then God sent us Fred and Lois. That was in 1932, right in the middle of the Depression. We couldn't find a single church to support us. We had to sell our furniture. Lois even sold her grand piano. That got us to Hang Chow with just a few dollars left over. The Lord supplied just enough for us to get here, too. We spent five very fruitful years in Hang Chow. Then the Japanese began bombing. They destroyed most of that beautiful city. But God protected us, didn't he, Mother Sweet? Oh, my, yes. One time we heard the planes and a lot of the women and girls came running into our house. I led them in the yard with my Bible in one hand and the American flag in the other. We knelt and prayed for God's protection, and the plane suddenly turned a right angle and went the other way. We stayed through the bombing, but when the Japanese landed troops at the port and began attacking, we had to evacuate. There was once a million people living in the city. Now there's only about 200,000 left. I can't wait to get there. Well, I know you're in a hurry, but you both need to learn the language. We've already reserved a place for you both at the Adventist Language School. The next day, the headmaster informed the new missionaries that the course took two years for most foreigners to complete. Some finished sooner, but that many never became fluent in a lifetime. You see, Chinese is one of the world's most difficult languages. Now John's childhood tongue had been Hindustani, and he had studied French, Latin, and Greek. But Chinese was totally different. Instead of an alphabet, the Chinese used what's called picture writing. A student had to memorize thousands of different pictograph characters and numerous combinations for the ways these characters combined could suggest an idea. For instance, a sun, and the moon indicated brightness. John had a near photographic memory, and he was also a natural mimic. Those gifts, combined with the Lord's help, allowed John to be able to carry on a simple street conversation within only six weeks. In August, Brother Beach and Vic, J. Frank Norris's assistant in Detroit, arrived and wanted to visit Hang Chow. You can imagine John and Oscar's delight at the opportunity to get out into the countryside, and especially for John, because he was excited to see 
the war-ravaged city, and the place that God had called him to serve. Brother Donaldson, what are all those mounds of dirt that we've seen along the way? Those are graves. The Chinese put their dead on top of the ground and piled dirt on it. Some of those graves have been there for hundreds, even thousands of years. Sometimes it seems to me like China is just one big graveyard. John silently contemplated what the veteran missionary had said. So many millions of Chinese souls must have died without ever even hearing the precious name of Jesus. Except for the armed Japanese soldiers who paced the aisles of the railway cars, the war seemed very, very far away. But as they neared Hangchow, the scene slowly began to change. The fields were overgrown and riddled with huge gaping holes from bombings. Occasionally, they could even see the charred remains of entire villages that had been burned to the ground. As they climbed off the train, they heard a very excited voice calling to them. Brother Fred, we are over here. It is so good to see you again. It's Pastor Du and some of the men from the church. The Chinese Christians were all very thin, but unlike all the other people bustling around them, they were all smiling. They all climbed into waiting rickshaws, and soon they were walking up the concrete steps to a large church building. Although buildings nearby were smashed to pieces by the Japanese bombs, this church building had not one single mark on it. None of our property has been damaged. We praise the Lord for that. Come inside. All the people are waiting to see you. As they entered the building, John saw that the sanctuary was completely packed in spite of the smothering summer heat. Many of the faces were glistening with tears, but again, all were smiling. The visitors were introduced by the Donaldsons. Again, John was deeply touched by the enthusiastic singing of the congregation. And when the offering basket was passed, it was piled high with coins and bills. John had to wonder how these impoverished, starving people could give anything at all. Brother Vic preached while Fred interpreted. After the services, people swarmed around the Americans, introducing themselves and sharing memories with the Donaldsons. Then, Pastor Du took them to the orphanage and the Bible school. The girls at the orphanage sang a hymn and recited verses of Scripture. These little children are from villages, stricken by famine. If our preacher boys had not brought them here, they would have starved to death. Now, they learn the Word of God. We are also feeding 88 older citizens every day. Brother John, they are all eager for you to come teach them. dinner they returned for another long church service. Afterward, the Donaldsons told stories until almost midnight. They told about when Pastor Dew and his brother had been saved and called the pastor. He had lived in a town about 10 miles from Hang Chow called Sing Ting. It was one of about 25 places outside of Hang Chow where they had established churches. They returned to Shanghai the next day, with John more determined than ever to learn to speak Chinese fluently. In November, the faculty agreed that he could finish his lessons in Hangzhou with a tutor. He would just have to return periodically for exams. Brother Oscar continued to study the language in Shanghai and was directing the Bible school as well. Also, there was one more reason why Oscar wanted to remain in Shanghai. There was a particular young Christian Reformed Church missionary named 
Miss Myrtle Huizinga, the Oscar intended to immerse. John stayed through Thanksgiving, a time when he really missed his family. He longed to see them, but he was at peace, content knowing he was where God wanted him. Finally, John boarded the train to Hang Chow. He spent the entire trip in fervent prayer. There were about 30 missionaries in Hang Chow, but John was the only fundamental Baptist. The day was November the 24th of 1940. All the while, World War II was ramping up. Europe was now under the heel of Hitler. Canada had entered the war, but the U.S. was still holding out. Japan had tightened its economic stranglehold on China and was softening up the interior with frequent bombings. Yeah, the war is going to play a huge part in the rest of the life and ministry of John Birch. Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek's ragtag army was holding out against the Japanese and in some places even counterattacking. They were only 50 miles away and had announced that they intended to recapture Hang Chow from the Japanese. Chinese guerrillas constantly ambushed Japanese soldiers. A band had even crept into the city and wounded the puppet mayor. Japanese reprisal was brutal, and on top of that, Hang Chow was facing a famine. Most people couldn't even afford to buy rice. On Christmas Day, John preached his first sermon to the Hang Chow congregation. Fifteen folks came forward to confess Christ as Lord and Savior. In the midst of this terrible suffering, the Chinese could find no other hope. Because of the tight security around the city, news from the churches outside Hang Chow was scarce. They were in no man's land, you might say where the Japanese patrolled by day and the Chinese army ruled by night. One of John's New Year's resolutions was to visit and encourage these churches, no matter the risk. On the third Saturday in January, John and Mr. Wu, one of the Chinese preachers, bicycled into the countryside southwest of Hang Chow to check on the congregation at Wang Shan and Wang Chang. They passed many burned villages and peasants begging for coins. They saw many poor, impoverished children lying almost lifeless in the dirt. In Wang Shan, they held a meeting that evening, and people filled every corner of the meeting house. They sang loud enough to drown out the sound of guns crackling across the rice paddies. The next day, they found that Wang Cheng was nothing but ashes. But John and Wu preached in a house, and another overflowing crowd came. John preached on burning their idols and turning to Christ. A large number responded to the Holy Spirit's moving. A message from the commanding officer of the Chinese troops that were encamped across the river from Hang Chow came for Pastor Du. But a John. This message is from a member of our church who has joined General Isimo's Chiang Kai-shek's army. He asked that we start evangelistic work among his men. Under cover of darkness, John and Pastor Du sneaked past the Japanese lines, but they lost their way in an ice storm. Then, by God's grace, they found the Chinese army. They discipled the officers and then returned to Hang Chow. Around this time, John received a letter from Mr. M. H. Wolf, who was the mission's president. He told John to stay in Hang Chow and not to risk his life any further. But John knew what God had laid on his heart, and he had to go and help these folks out past the Japanese lines. Oscar Wells came to Hang Chow for a short visit and John met him at the train station. Hey, Oscar, I'm over here. Hello, Brother John, how are you? I've got so much to tell you. God has been so good. Well, I can't wait to hear it. I have some news myself. Myrtle and I are going to get married soon. 
so I thought I'd come spend a few weeks on the firing line with you before I settle down to wedded bliss and all the responsibilities of marriage. Congratulations, Oscar. She's a good girl. Well, for adventure, you've come to the right place. Pastor Du and I are about to go to Shengjiao. That's across the line into free China, isn't it? Won't it be quite a trick to get back there? Yes, but we must get to the churches outside Hengchao. Some have had no Christian fellowship for years. I think we need to assure them that we have not forgotten about them. We will have to be very careful so the Japanese don't discover our intention. Well, that sounds good to me. When do we leave? They traveled by bicycle and then hired a boat to travel the 200 miles to Shangzhou. The pastor told them how great the need for laborers was and about how hungry the people were for the gospel. They assured him that they would be back to help whenever they could. Oscar returned to Shanghai for his wedding to Myrtle on June 28th. They went to visit John at Heng Chow for a short honeymoon, then visited China again in August. Oscar was determined that God wanted him and Myrtle to go back there to evangelize and start churches. About this time, John got another letter from Mr. Wolf telling him to stay away from the fighting. He said, we need evangelists, not martyrs. But John knew that he had to follow the Lord. One of the few luxuries that John had allowed himself was a small shortwave radio. Late at night, he would listen to KGEI in San Francisco, where they would broadcast messages to families in the Orient. One night, John almost fell out of his bed when he heard his own mother's voice coming through the radio. Hello, John Birch and Hang Chow, China. We hope you're listening. Mail has been slow lately, but we're all well, and we're praying for you. The sound of his family's voice made John very homesick. In August of 1941, the U.S. Secretary of State Cordell Hull urged U.S. mission agencies to order their representatives out of Japanese-occupied China. Mr. Wolf cabled all of the Fundamental Baptists to leave China immediately as a matter of life and death. Mrs. Sweet had already told her children that she would die in China. John agreed, and the Donaldsons and the Wells made the decision unanimous. For the most part, all the other denominations' missionaries left. However, most of the members of the China Inland Mission stayed. On September 24th, John and Wu left to visit Shengzhou again. They were accompanied by a young Chinese gorilla named Wang. He came along to protect them from the Japanese. It was a long and difficult trip that included at one point having to hide for 32 hours. With the help of God, they barely escaped several different Japanese patrols and made it safely to Shangzhou. He made his base there and bicycled to the outlying villages to preach, just like he had done in Hangzhou. John heard of a noted anti-Christian town called Shechai, where an old man had been waiting many, many years for baptism. He had almost been killed by the communists and had stood alone against great persecution. He witnessed faithfully to relatives and neighbors. John traveled to him to baptize and disciple him. John also met a Chinese officer who had been converted by reading the booklet by General Chiang Kai-shek titled, Why I Believe in Jesus Christ. This officer wanted John and his companions, Hu and Chen, to preach to his men. Brother Hu preached two hours and gave an invitation to which every man stood up. Brother, I don't think they understood you clearly. Brother Hu added that becoming a Christian might bring persecution from relatives and again 
the whole company stood up. In early December of that year, John had to return to Shanghai, which was in Japanese occupied territory, in order to complete his final language exam. On Saturday, December 6th of 1941, while he was in Shanghai, John ate supper with an American missionary. He told them of his plans to slip through the Japanese lines to get back to Free China. They urged him to stay and rest over the weekend, but John refused. I appreciate the offer, but I promised the Chinese soldiers that I would preach to them this Sunday. John slipped through the lines into Free China one day before the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. If he had taken the missionary's advice, and stayed through the weekend, he likely would have been captured by the Japanese and interned in a prison camp for the duration of the war. Instead, on that day that shall live in infamy, John Birch preached to some Chinese soldiers and then continued on to Shangzhou. In January, John received word that the Donaldsons, Wells, and Mother Sweet had all been arrested and were in custody of the Japanese. But God had blessed, and they were all well. John had a hard time deciding what to do next. He struggled between whether he should volunteer, perhaps as a chaplain, or continue preaching. He had hardly any money left, so on April the 13th, he wrote to the American Military Commission in Chongqing to volunteer as a chaplain or even as a private in the army. On the evening of April 27th, John stopped at a crowded Chinese inn to eat a cheap meal of red rice, green bamboo, and meat scraps. As he was sitting and eating the meal, a Chinese man sat down silently and secretly asked him if he was an American. John was tanned from the sun and dressed as a Chinese. So, with his hat pulled down over his eyes, he could easily pass for a Chinese man. After he finished his meal, John followed the secretive little man to a sampan riverboat. John noticed that it lay low in the water. Obviously, it was carrying a heavy load. The man pointed at the door and said, Americans, indicating that there was Americans inside the boat. John couldn't believe it, so he knocked on the door softly. Are any Americans in there? No Japanese can make up an accent like that. They opened the door, and John saw five overgrown American flyers crowded in the hole. One of the flyers was so shocked to see an American that he used Jesus' name as an expletive. That's a very good name, but I'm not him. Colonel James H. Doolittle, United States Army Air Force. These boys and I just delivered a little present to Tojo, and we're having a bit of trouble getting back home. Uh, I'm I'm John Birch, a Baptist missionary. Well, missionary or whatever, we sure are glad to see you. You really bombed Tokyo? Well, it was a super secret mission commissioned by the president. I can't tell you much except that we bombed Japan and had no place to land. We ran out of fuel and bailed out in a rainstorm about 9.30 Saturday night, There were about 15 other planes. Have you heard of any other Americans being found? Uh, no, sir. I hope they didn't land behind Japanese lines or get picked up by the Jap spies. Their spies are everywhere, probably looking for you to collect a reward. Well, that's not a very encouraging thought. Do you suppose you could get us to the American military headquarters in Chongqing? I can take you as far as Lan Chai. I know some Chinese officers there who could get you safely to Chongqing. John fed the hungry airmen. Then they began their journey. Colonel Doolittle introduced his men, and they all began swapping stories of their experiences since bailing out of their B-25 bomber. The Lord must have been watching out for you. So many things could have happened. What kind of missionary did you say you are? I'm with the Fundamental Baptist Fellowship, sir. Never heard of them. I haven't heard from them myself in about six months. What have you been living on? Well, I've been trusting the Lord to provide. 
John told them how he had sent a letter to volunteer but had not heard back from the military, and Colonel Doolittle told him that he would put in a good word for him at Shunking. He told John to write down any messages that he had for the people back home and that he would make sure they were delivered. Colonel Doolittle had been very impressed with John's interpreting skills and the rapport he had with the Chinese officers. Over the next few weeks, John stayed very busy helping to account for and rescue Doolittle's raiders. In all, John helped to find and rescue 60 of the 80 men. Well, we're going to have to stop the story there for this week. Yeah, we, we could go on and continue telling of God's protection for a good while longer, but we'll just have to continue it next week. Until then, we'll finish up today with this verse. Philippians 3, verse number 8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ.